Hey guys, Cade Wilcox here, host of the Primitive Podcast. Thank you for joining us for another episode where we take a deep dive into all things leadership. On today's episode, we have Keith Mann. Keith Mann has a great background. He started out at Arthur Anderson, one of the big four accounting firms, was the CFO of United Supermarkets for a while, uh, was the CFO and then eventual CEO of Lubbock National Bank. So he has a long track record of really great leadership positions and learned a whole lot talking to him just about leadership and what he's learned through his leadership journey. So thank you for joining us for the podcast and have a great day. Moments of clarity don't come when you're extremely stressed out and you got to find a way to, to find that, to find that peace and that balance and the clarity or else you're just chasing your tail. And in your, in your company and your owners, they, they depend on you to not be chasing your tail and to not, and to not be overly fearful. In, in the midst of tragedy, that's when you got to be calm and focused. Keith, thank you so much for joining the podcast. I've known you a long time. It's a real pleasure to have you here. And so thanks for joining us. Great. Thank you. Love um, being here. So for those who listen to the podcast that don't know who Keith Mann is, walk us through your background. Tell us a little bit about your family, about your career, about, you know, kind of your leadership journey and all that, all that good stuff. You bet. Actually, I was raised here in Lubbock. My father was an accounting professor at Texas Tech for 43 years, and I didn't want to go to Tech because of that, like a lot of kids who grow up here. <laughs> yeah. I wound up at Tech and in accounting and absolutely loved it. Had him for three classes, and he was by far and away my favorite professor. That's great. And I wish I'd kept track over the years of how many people have actually told me that, that he was their favorite professor. So graduated in 93 with a master's degree, went to Dallas, uh, worked for Arthur Anderson, who many people know is the firm that was behind the Enron debacle. Uh, unfortunately— Were you in the middle of that? Was it your fault? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, good. No, but uh, I can tell you that there's a lot of great people in that firm that really got hurt hmm. through all of that, and it was really sad. Um, United Supermarkets was one of my clients at the time, and they asked me to come back and be their CFO. I'd been in Dallas about six years, so I'd really had enough of it, and I was ready to move, and that was a wonderful you know, kind of dream opportunity come true. Came back and got to work for United and the Snell family for about six years, and that was a wonderful, wonderful time. Then uh, L&B, Lubbock National, asked me to come be their CFO, so I did that. Had a 10-year run there left there as president, and now I, uh, I've been the CEO for Diversified Lenders going on five years. That's so crazy three, how fast it's gone. Yeah, three wonderful family businesses here. In how long were you the president at LMB? For about three years. Okay. So, yeah, so I was CFO for about seven. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. So what, uh, w- what was your experience like going from kind of CFOs, number-driven, kind of that that – to CEO, like what did that transition look like for you? And what was that experience going from the numbers to the guy leading the organization? Well, when you look at good CFOs, they they are well in tune with the numbers, but they're way m- more into strategy hmm. than you think. And, and a good CFO should be. And so a CFO should be building a team that is really focused in on internal controls, understanding the business, but really you should be removing yourself and in, in much more into strategy issues, people issues, vision issues, and really playing a, playing a very supportive role, uh, both to the CEO and to the board. So the, the transition really is not that big. What was the hardest part? Like, so it sounds like those aspects of being a CFO prepared you to be Correct. CEO, but what were, the, what were the maybe the biggest surprises when you made that transition? I really had been very involved in the human resources aspect, and that, that actually reported to me as a CFO role. Mm-hmm. And so um, I thought I was prepared, but, but really it, it's always the people issues. Mm-hmm. The financial issues, you can figure that out. Problems, you can figure it out. There's usually math involved. You can figure that out. You can figure out the dollars and cents. Mm-hmm. It's always the people. Mm-hmm. And so how to lead people, how to, how to challenge people, how to get rid of people that need to be, and so forth. Mm-hmm. That's where it all boils down to. That's all fascinating. That to I, it's a helpful perspective on what it means to be a really good CFO because I think most people, when they think CFO, they only think numbers. Right. And so that's a that's a fascinating perspective, and clearly, you know, would have helped you transition to the role of of CEO. I think most people misinterpret what a CFO is. Mm. You know, when when you look around, say Lubbock, it's a lot of small businesses, and a lot of people are called CFO, but they're really controllers. And when you look at, a, say, a large Fortune 500 company or, or, or much larger companies, 
CFOs and controllers are very, very distinct in, in what they do. And the smaller the company, the, the lines blur on really who's doing what. So I think a lot of people misunderstand a CFO, mm -hmm. and it, they instantly start thinking of a controller, numbers, you know, putting together journal entries and all that. that that's, that's a controller job, which are wonderful jobs, but it's in a larger organization, that's not what a CFO should be doing. That's fascinating. That's really good. So 2020 has been a really interesting year for, for a lot of folks. When you reflect, you know, for those listening to the podcast, this is being recorded in mid-December of 2020. So when you look back, uh, Keith, in, you know, on your 2020, what have you, what have you learned about yourself um, through, through this very unique experience all of us have been through? Wow, what a great question. When you say, what have you learned about yourself? And that is, you know, when you, when you roll back in time, we do a lot of work in the oil and gas space. And you look back into January and February, and, and I think you learn real quickly that um, if you had any sort of ego in this business at all, um, you got wiped out really fast. Mm -hmm. And so I think some of, the, some of the lessons that you learn that, or that you see unfold is be careful on the bets you're making as a business. Mm -hmm because overnight things can change, and they actually did. And literally overnight in some of the financial markets and the commodities markets in, in March, things changed uh, overnight, over, over a weekend in particular. And then the next thing you know, oil is, is crashing through the bottom of the floor. And so when you, when, you, when you dissect a lot of that, you know, hopefully what you're learning from yourself is that you, you can look back and go, okay, Remember these times. Don't be arrogant in what you're doing. Don't don't bet the farm mm -hmm. on, on the way you go about your business. And when times are good, be very careful that, in fact, I want to talk a little bit about this book here because uh, it, it dials into some of these concepts. But be careful. Be careful in the good times because they can change rapidly. Make sure that you haven't put your, your company or your owners in a position that can fail if things change overnight. What did you do practically? You know, it, for us at Primitive, things change really fast. It's like literally what you just said. One day everything's just cranking away, and the next day, uh, I'll never forget it the rest of my life, March 16th for us, you know, it just dramatically changed. And so um, I think back to that day, I think to the way I felt, I think to the way we started making decisions. What what did that look like for you? Like, what did you do with your team? What were you thinking? How did you... How did you try to kind of like calm the storm, for lack of better words? So yeah. just like practically, what did you do in that moment of disruption um, with your team and your clients and things like that? Well, the first thing I, <clears throat> I think that you have to do as a leader is you have to be present. Mm -hmm. And so we pulled everybody together and we spent time in the same room and spent time just talking to each other and allowing each other to share their thoughts and fears and concerns about what was going on. At one point, we, we kind of described the situation as trying to catch falling sharp knives. God. Like, you're going to get hurt, you're going to get cut. How do, how do we do this? Mm -hmm. And so I think what was really important was we, we pulled together our team, we pulled together our owners, and we sat and we spent time staring at each other and talking because that, that was so important to do at that time, because everybody was afraid. Everybody was concerned. Our clients were concerned. So we spent time with each other, letting everybody just air their fears and their concerns, and we spent time on the phone with our clients. We were reaching the time with COVID. You couldn't really go spend time in right. the client's offices. And so we spent time on the phone and, and helping them understand that, you know, we're, we're, we're in a stable position and we're there to help them. And so they needed that reassurance and that confidence that, hey, we're not going anywhere. Because we had, we had um, several companies that we talked to during that time that were coming to us that their banks were cutting them off. And they were, or their other finance companies were, were telling them, no, we can't deal with you anymore, you're in oil and gas, and literally giving them a two week notice mm. to be gone. And that's a scary proposition for anybody. And so we, we made sure that we were trying to even talk to those companies and walk them through, you know, a transition phase and, and really just trying to have a calm voice during the time and, and a clear head and making sure that we were listening. I think it was so important to that at that time was to listen, listen to everybody, listen to your clients, what's really going on. It was hard to, 
to really know what was going on in the news media. Listen to your owners. What are their fears and concerns, and how do we how do we manage that? So it was time. Yeah, that's really good. As as the leader of the organization, what were you doing to absorb your own stress and your own concern? And your you know because everyone deals with with these types of things on a personal level, not just a work level. So what were you doing to kind of stay healthy and stay in, stay engaged and stay in a strong place? Well, part of what helped me was what I just described there too, hmm. was being present. It wasn't just for the team. Yeah, yeah, I needed the team around me. I needed, I needed to be in the presence of owners. I needed to be uh, around our people to hear them. Uh, I, I needed to know where their concerns were, where their fears were, so that we could you know, chart a course. I mean, you may have grand visions and uh, mission statements and so on and so forth, but you know what? In, in March of 2020, all of that just flew out the door. That's right. And you had to be careful, and so you really had to listen. Well, hey, where are your fears? Hmm. And what are you worried about? You know, in the midst of this pandemic and oil and gas debacle, hey, what, what, what's keeping you up at night? Hmm. And so that, that really helped me then chart, you know, very short-term courses of action. Same thing with our clients. They're really dialing into uh, where their where their where their injury was about to happen, and and how we could either help or not. Because there's times when you can't really you can't solve everybody's problems. Yeah. So that helped me, and I think at the time, you know, kind of at home, we just we spent more time. We were of course we were roll, about to roll into a lockdown, but just spending time around Sherry and her boys, and uh, trying to eat well exercise yeah. and just kind of have ba- cre- maintain a balance right. and really trying to sleep although it was hard yeah and you know in the midst of all this try to be as healthy as you can mentally emotionally spiritually try to be healthy so that you can make good calls yeah. good decisions I appreciate that and it is it is hard but at a at a time when you need at a time when personal health is the hardest, you need it the most. And so it can be hard to press into those things because you feel like, no, I need to work longer hours or I need to you know, right. make something happen. And, and sometimes it's, it's hard enough where you can't really try any harder. You That's know? Right. And so I, I, I admire your approach well, you, there. You need those moments of clarity. And moments of clarity don't come when you're extremely stressed out. And you got to find a way to, to find that, mm-hmm. to find that peace and that balance and the clarity. Or else you're just chasing your tail, mm. and in your in your company and your owners, they they depend on you to not be chasing your tail, and to not and to not be overly fearful. In, in the midst of tragedy, that's when you got to be calm and focused. Mm. It's really good. So my next question for you this is all really good stuff. Um, when you think about the role of a leader in an organization, and you can answer this from your own personal experience. You can speak into it aspirationally. You can think about it in your current role at, at Diversified, or you can think about it in your past roles. So kind of any of those are fair game. But when you think about the role of a leader for an organization, what do you see as their primary responsibilities or the things from your own experience you feel like are really critical and important for a leader to provide an organization? I touched on it when we were talking about kind of the, the, the tragedy and the turmoil, but it doesn't stop there. So when I say, you know, be present and engaged, I mean all the time. Mm-hmm. And I think it's so critical for leaders to be around. And, you know, you, you look at some of these larger corporations and people never have any idea who their leaders really are or, or they might read about them. And that, that's unfortunate. One of the things that always really impressed me about being at United was the family and the leadership throughout the organization. They were everywhere all the time. Now, that might drive some people crazy, but they were there and they were very present. And I was really learning from that. Mm -hmm. Um, If you worked up in the corporate office, you were in the stores all the time. And you were listening, listening to our people, listening to our customers. That's how you figure things out. That's really how you figure things out. And so being present and then, but not just present, but being engaged. Um, I was always fascinated watching the family at United, how they knew everybody in the store. They they remembered names and from whether it was somebody sacking groceries to cutting meat or whatever it was. I mean, they were they they were fantastic at that, and I learned a lot from that. And so, learning how to really be present and engaged kind of started with them. And so, you know, I, as I've talked about working for different families in Lubbock, don't ever take me. 
don't take me wrong on anything. Sure. If I'm talking about one, that doesn't mean the others sure. weren't good at Understood. it. I'm just trying to highlight Absolutely. some points. And so president engaged. And of course, um, I think it's very important to, to be driving towards a bigger picture but at the same time, you've got to understand the building blocks and the details mm -hmm. of what you're doing because sometimes you might be pursuing a course that's just not possible. It's just not feasibly possible no matter how loud you bark, no matter how hard you push. It might not be in the best interest of a company or it might not work financially. It might be too risky. And I've seen, um, not, not in the organizations where I've worked, but primarily in the organizations that I used to audit when I was in Dallas, I saw too many leaders just n not into the details of understanding what was really driving their company. In fact, I, I've seen that quite a bit in banking and in finance is, is that you'll have companies out there that, you know, the leaders, they, they can sell the sizzle on a steak and they can sell their product and they're really good maybe at that. They have a great elevator speech, but they really don't know what's going on inside their own organization. Mm -hmm. And, and they're generally terrible listeners because they want to talk. They want to tell you what's going on. But the reality is if you go listen to their team and you'll listen to f from, from, you know, from the janitor all the way up, if, you, if they would listen to their team, they'll figure things out, but they won't. And they don't take the time to do it. So um, you know, when, you, when you talk about a role, you know, to me, you got to be engaged and what's really going on, you got to understand the details. It's really fascinating how that can shape the vision because my the first instinct I had when you were talking about that is like, well, what about the vision? You know, what what about what about the future? What about what the future could be? What about cr crafting and creating the future? And so maybe maybe a really good leader isn't all just vision or all just what's currently real and what's currently happening, but someone who can take both the reality as of, of what the team is hearing and what the team is seeing and what yeah. what's really happening in reality, and then that influences the future. So how, how would yeah. you balance that? Because as a futurist over here, I'm yeah. like really struggling with that answer. It's like, <laughs> wait a second, what, you know, uh, there's nothing wrong with the sizzle or the spice or, right. the, or the future. Right. So how have you tried to balance those two things? Okay, we'll, we'll kind of go back to your point. Yeah, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the vision and the system. You have to know that. You have to do both. You've got to be all of that. And when you look at the greatest leaders out there, they're all of that. They're not, they're not just one-sided. Right. They're very well balanced. Absolutely. You, you, you better be prepared on a moment's notice to give your elevator speech to somebody mm. as to what's going on in your organization and how to sell the vision and what you're all about because you, you'll get asked. Or you might have to make a pitch or, or whatever it is. You have to be good at that. But if that's all you have as a leader, then then, then your day is coming yeah. because you really aren't going to be tied into what's really going on yeah. in the organization. So you have to do it all. Yeah, that's really good. I mean, it, it's it's if you don't have if you don't have the insight from the team, from the clients, from the listening, from all the things you said, it's almost like you have a, a thin veneer of a vision, but it has real no substance. It has it's not really rooted in in truth, right. perhaps even. Um, so I've never thought of it that way. I I've, I, I <laughs> could almost pause the podcast and really like think through that. Um, but that's really it's really good. What what else do you think of in, in terms of the role of a leader? Find great people, mm -hmm. because the way that you do all that that I was just describing is by having a great team. And you, it's a little overused, but you say, oh, try to hire people smarter than you. That is so true. Mm -hmm. Find people that are really great and passionate and, and try, to, try to inspire them, but, but dial into them and, and push them and work with them. And you'll, you'll find yourself better able to... Um, do all that I was talking about, from the details to the vision. If you can, if you can build a good team, mm -hmm. you know, and, and build a team that trusts you. I mean, you've got to be trustworthy, because if you're not trustworthy, the team's not going to trust you. They're not going to share with you, and and you're still not going to know what's going on. That's really good. You uh, are the first podcast guest to ever bring a book with you, which I think is awesome. So <laughs> what what? about this book, and you can tell, uh, for those who can't see it, you can tell it's very much read. Like, it's not one of those books that just sits on a shelf. So yeah. can you tell me maybe some of the biggest things you've learned from this book? Yeah, so this book's called How the Mighty Fall. It's by Jim Collins. And so 
I guess in the early 2000s, Jim Collins wrote a book, um, Good to Great, and everybody was quoting it. Every conference you went to, it just seemed to be all over, good to great, and talking about level five leaders and the, the term, hey, the right seat on the bus became in vogue. Hey, if you, you need to put people on the right seat on the bus or get them off the bus, and these constant analogies to the bus. And what fascinates me about this book is, is the author came in and said, well, hold on a second. We've had some really good companies, some great companies fail. And in fact, some of the companies that he was talking about in the book, Good to Great, failed. Hmm. And I love how he wanted to go back and dissect and say, time out, what happened? I tend to learn better that way. I like to learn from dissecting something that went wrong. Um, people talk about failure all the time, and I hate it. But it's part of life, and it's how, it's how you build a corp- you know, corporation and a corporate culture. And, and, and it's really how you build your business, unfortunately. But he, he took a deep dive, how the mighty fall. And so throughout all of his uh, research and so forth, he came up with five kind of, I guess, key points in here. And if, if you don't mind, I just want I to read them. Yeah, these are not please. mine. I, I yeah, love these. That would be so, awesome. And so point number one is he labeled it hubris born of success. Um, you can lose sight of what actually brought you success, and sometimes even luck brought you success. Mm-hmm. And so the, the more arrogant you are about that, that's your first warning sign. And so that, that moved into the second phase of the decline you might still be, you're on the upslope here, but it was an undisciplined pursuit of more. The word undisciplined was, was very important there, overreaching. And you can see this in different type of industries. When they, when they begin to feel like they're bulletproof and they start making big bets or into different areas where they really are reaching way outside of their zone. The third, the third point here was the denial of risk and the denial of the peril that you face. And so when, when things start to, to not go well or you're starting to uh, suffer some, some setbacks and so forth, you'll hear people start, um, as, as he says here, they'll blame external factors. It's always some other issue. It's always somebody else's fault. It's always something's fault. It's, mm. it's the economy. It's COVID. It's, and there's, and there's, real, there's real destruction that's gone on in 2020. But in a sense, I kind of took a lot of what he was saying there is <clears throat> denial of your role in that as well. Mm. Denial of your role in having taken these risks and in, and in not, not really taking these perils, as he would describe them, uh, seriously. Mm. And then the, the fourth step was when you see a company starting to grasp for salvation, you're, you're on the downhill side here. And some of the things that he mentioned there was when you hear companies uh, trying to look for that silver bullet, and some of those he described as, "Hey, we've got to go out and get a very charismatic leader, and they're going to they're going to lead us out of this," or they all of a sudden enter into some bold and untested mm-hmm. strategy, um, or you hear a company say, "Oh, hey, we're going to go through this radical transformation. Basically, we don't know what's going on, we don't know how to fix it, so we're just going to radically transform everything, and hopefully mm-hmm. that'll work." and um, that one of the last things he mentioned was when you see companies going for some just game-changing acquisition. You know what, we're going to go acquire such and such or some new technology or something, whatever that may be, whatever company that may be, and that, that's going to solve our problems. Mm-hmm. And acquisitions are probably the hardest thing you'll ever go through in companies. And so thinking that you're going to go through acquisitions and make life better is is generally off the mark. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean it doesn't need to happen. Right. But when you hear, you know, CEOs touting some huge, this is this is going to change the course. The, the authors arguing, uh, you're you're probably already in stage four decline. Mm-hmm. And then stage five is you're pretty much done. He called it capitulation and irrelevance or death of the company. And these cumulative setbacks and failures, they just erode the strength mm-hmm. of the company. And to to the point where they're either going to dismantle sell, whatever it might be. And one of the very interesting companies he mentions in here is Bank of America, but you got to go back into the 70s and 80s, what he's talking about, the original Bank of America, not the one you know today, mm. but the one that failed and, and was actually sold. Mm. Now today, there's been a series of name changes and so forth to this great company we have as Bank of America, but back, back in the day, I mean, that was 
I think he quoted it as the, the largest institution in the world at the time, and it failed. Mm. So It's really good. I mean, when you think of the first three points, particularly like hubris, undisciplined approach for more, or denial of risk, uh, I wonder if it'd be fair to say that one really important characteristic of an organization is self-awareness, right? And so if if you agree with that, what what do you think as a leader, how, how do you stay self-aware so you don't forget where your success has come from or you don't, uh, you know, start to have a, 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 a inaccurate, you know, depiction of reality. And so then it starts, you start going off in a wrong direction because you've kind of lost grip. So how do you think a leader really promotes and, and, and builds self-awareness, um, which then helps promote self-awareness as an organization? I think it goes back to what we discussed earlier in understanding, we'll call it the details. Why are you successful? What, what is driving your success? Who's driving your success? And not just your customer base. Too many times, I think companies want to look to a, a customer base, for example, and that's a great place to understand, but what about your people? Mm-hmm. What about how those customers are connected to your team? What, what's really driving your success? You know, is it blind luck? And I, I think understanding all of this is part of the self-awareness. You've got to know that information not just selling your vision, you gotta know why. And part of the author's arguments in here is that too many companies and too many leaders, they don't know why. Mm-hmm. They're taking risk and they're patting themselves on the back for a lot of success, but they're not quite sure why. Maybe, maybe they, and when I say that, not quite sure why, I mean, they know the successes they've had, say with customer wins or product right. sales, and they know some of that, but, but what, what's the real tipping points behind their success? Mm-hmm. And, and who's behind it. And I think that's where it's got to start, yeah. that self-awareness. It's really good. Um, wh- what, what is your approach to your own personal growth? Like, how do you stay inspired? So much of being a leader is giving of yourself to others. Right. But what do you do on a personal level? And feel free to be as practical as you like sure. on, on how, do you, how do you approach personal growth and staying inspired as a leader? Yeah, um, when I think about that, you know, the, the first thought that had come to mind was, I mean, you, you have to spend time around uh, people, people who you, who you would deem as to be good leaders or mentors, and you have to listen. I think in the end, good listeners, I mean, good leaders listen more than they talk. Mm-hmm. And so I think, you know, for me, I like to seek out uh, people who I think are either good leaders um, in the field that I'm in or other fields, and I love to listen to them. I love to ask questions. I like to understand kind of how they lead, whether it's in, uh, whether it's a not-for-profit charity, whether it's a healthcare organization, whether it's, you know, any type of business or government. I like, I, I like to hear people. I, I learn that way. Um, I like to read. I wish I could say I was a great reader, but I'm a slow reader, and that's very frustrating. And so, you know, it'll take me a long time to to read and digest something. Um, One thing here I think is practical maybe for your listeners is there's, I know of one source and there may be others uh, where they have summaries, book summaries. One's called Soundview. Have you ever heard of Soundview? No, I haven't. So what they do is they take books, kind of like maybe this book here, How the Mighty Fall. I don't don't know if it's on that list or not because I read the actual book. And they summarize the book into eight pages, always eight pages. Wow. And they give you a synopsis of the book. And it's, and it's meant for speed reading. Because a lot of leadership books, I mean, actually you can boil it down to eight pages and right. that's kind of all you need. Right. And so that's something maybe that's practical awesome. for, leader, uh, for your listeners to do is go check it out. And there's a lot of good books out there. It's a little bit at times like Netflix in that you're not going to get the blockbusters that are out right away. Uh, but there's a lot. They have a lot of good information. Uh, that's that's awesome. I too am an extremely slow reader, and I struggle with retention. So I can spend all this time reading a book, and then a week later, some a week later, someone says, "What'd you learn?" And I'm like, "I have no idea. I have to go back to all the things I underlined." You know. So that'll be a really helpful tool for me. I have to mark and highlight and make notes because because then you, you do want to go back sure. in time and, sure. and remind yourself kind of what stood out. So yeah. I have to do that. That's awesome. Um, my last question for you is if you could speak to your younger self, what advice would you give yourself based on what you know now? If, if Keith Mann could go back 20 years and yeah. speak to the young leader that was you know, developing at that point, what would, you, what would you tell him? Well, I'd go back into my 20s, and I'd go back to when we were living 
living in Dallas and, um, you know, thinking that I had to work the crazy hours and I had to do what I was doing to try to get ahead or to try to survive, try to pay the bills, what, whatever it was to build a career. And I'd go back and say, hey, you know what? Over the course of your life, your jobs are going to change. No telling how many times. Um, we, we all hope they don't, but, but the reality is sure. they're going to, especially for this next upcoming generation. But I'd go back and say, absolutely focus on your marriage. Do not let any career, any job, it's not worth not being dialed into your marriage. Because I think too many times, and we struggled through this, that we think, well, I have to do this for my family, or I have to do this to try to maybe you know learn something or get another promotion. And at the end of the day, what you really want is you want to be married for 50 years, and you're and if your job changes 10 times, that's okay. Hmm. And I'd go back and say, don't lose sight of that because it's really easy to. You know, We got married in our mid-20s and, and lived in Dallas, and, and it was hard. I traveled all the time. It was really hard on Sherry, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that she stuck with me, quite frankly, through all that. Hmm. But I'd go back and say, hey, make sure you're doing all you can to focus more on her because at the end of the day, that's what's going to matter. Hmm. That's really good. Thanks for all your time. It's uh, been really great having you on the podcast. Thank you. It's been an honor and I appreciate it.